I don't know if I'm live right now or not, but if I am, welcome to Close Encounters of the Ghost Kind. I'm just waiting to uh, see on the monitor here if we uh, come up live. It is cold tonight. When I came in, it was 23 degrees. It had been snowing off and on all day today. And you know what? I don't think I'm live. It's driving me nuts. Un momento. As I navigate to the right spot. Okay. Oh, oh, oh. We are live. Now I've got the feet up. We're looking somewhat live. I'm looking somewhat like a ghost. Hmm. Look at that. Let me make one adjustment. Hello, Scott. How are you, my friend? I'm just trying to work out some bugs here. Got a few bugs in the lighting tonight. I'm going to tell a couple of scary ghost stories that, from my life, and uh, we'll kind of go from there. If any of you've got any scary ghost stories, we'd like to hear them. I had a pile of YouTube videos that I was going to. Uh, play and, and apparently I wore the wrong color shirt because it is going away. Hey Bill, how are you? Glad you're along for the ride here. Anyway, every every Halloween for the last several years I've done this little show and, and we've kind of played with it and had a bit of fun with it. Um, nothing spectacular about this program it's just a, a show that um, that I do for fun and we'll just kind of play along I was gonna set up my phone so people could call in but uh, I did not oh got a little uh, ghost over my uh, shoulder there for a second anyway uh, just gonna have a little bit of fun where we've got a little bit of a like I say a lighting issue and we'll, we'll kind of work through those problems. They're not really problems at all. But anyway, I hope everybody out there is doing well. Um, oh, looks like uh, the Fitzgerald family is all watching this on the TV. All right. Well, I'm going to start with a ghost story from when I was probably seven or so. When I was a young child, uh, my family lived on the grounds of the Utah State Prison. And at the prison, um, it, it's, it's much different than it is today. The, the, the prison is still in the same spot, still has a lot of the same old buildings, but where my house was is now, um, I don't even know what facility it is, it's changed so many times. But our house just sat off of where current I-15 goes and we were, uh, it, back then it was State Street, and we lived inside the fence line. And surrounding us, to the north, to the south of us were alfalfa fields, and to the west and to the north of us, depending on the year, there were either tomato crops or corn crops that the prison would grow and the prisoners would go out and um, they, they would be farmers, basically. And they would sell the, the the prison would sell the produce and, and use the produce for 
uh, different things. Anyway, the year that the corn would grow, the corn would grow probably six, seven feet tall, um, and it would grow from our house about half a mile to the north, and then it would go a mile or so to the to the west of us. I used to play in the cornfield all the time, go out there and, and knock corn stalks down and make huts. You know, as, as a seven-year-old boy, you can kind of imagine that. As we, as we um, lived out there, and um, we had, you know, all kinds of, of things out there. I remember one. It was it was late summer, so the corn, the, they they hadn't harvested the corn yet, and it was starting to turn, and uh, you know, turn to the, not the green stalks, but the the older stalks. <clears throat> and I remember. Uh, out there playing and, and my sister and I, I I can't remember if we had an argument or or what but anyway I was out in the corn kind of hiding from from my sister and she I, I was at a vantage point that I could see the house I was probably maybe 50 yards in the corn but I could I could see her house and I saw my sister go in the house so I figured ah, I'll just stay out and play a little bit longer so I went to where one of my forts were and as I was there at my fort, just kind of playing, it was, you know, it seemed like a massive clearing that I had made, but in reality it was probably a 10 foot by 10 foot space that I had made in the middle of all this corn. And I remember running, and I distinctly remember the hair on the back of my neck just standing straight out. And just that eerie creepy feeling and so I decided well I'll I'll start heading back and my fort was probably in the middle of the corn so I was, I was at least a quarter of a mile away from my home and I distinctly remember hearing a woman's voice say Bobby and I turned to look to see who it was and there was nobody there. So I took off running towards my house down the rows of corn. And as I was running, I could hear that voice again. Bobby! And I kept running. One more time. I heard that. And it was, it was a shrill voice this time. Not the voice a calm voice like it had been before. It was a shrill voice that said, Bobby! I stopped, and I looked around, and I was so scared I didn't know what to do because the voice was coming from behind me. I looked down the rows of corn, and I ran like two or three rows over so I could look down those rows of corn, and then I ran back the other way. And there was nobody there. Again, the hair on my arms, the hair on my neck, and every sense, you know, that tingly feeling was there. So again, I started running towards the house. And I ran, it seemed like I ran forever to get to the house. And just before I got to the edge of the cornfield, all of the fear, all of that tension, all of that tingly feeling just went away. And I walked into the house. And I suspected that my sister was probably snuck out and, and uh, was out in the corner and was chasing me, trying to scare me. As I walked in, there she was in the front room watching TV completely unexplained to this day. I have no idea who that was or what that was. So that's one of my scary stories from the Utah State Prison, probably about 1964, 65, right in, right in there. The next one is also from the prison. And this was a couple of years later, so it's probably 1967, 68. 
And um, as I was there, where our house was located, it was located on the west side of what is now I-15. And um, it was State Street that just went there. So it was a, a two-lane road on one side and a two-lane road on the other side. State Street was the main thoroughfare through the state at that time. Ran from the Salt Lake City Capitol all the way down through St. George. And, and if you were going to California, you traveled on State Street the entire way. Or Highway, I think it's Highway 89. But anyway, on the east side of State Street, there was a pistol range. And my family all the time would go over to the pistol range, and, and my father and mother would shoot their guns and, and do some target practice and those kind of things. Well, over there, uh, by the target range, between our house and the target range, lay a cemetery for prisoners that either died in prison or were executed and their families would not claim them. And so um, it was always kind of eerie because it, was, it, was, it wasn't it was a very big graveyard. I mean, there was probably only uh, 12 or 13 uh, graves there. And they were marked with wooden uh, headstones, uh, you know, and basically all it was was a person's name, the year that they were born, and then the year that they were either executed or the, the year that they died in prison. And so while there, uh, you know, it was always always kind of scary to go go past the prison grounds and, and go past the, the prison uh, uh, cemetery there and stuff. It was, like I say, it was really small and it was unkept. You know, there were ant hills all over in there in the grave, sagebrush growing, and then you could see the headstones. Or the head, had had boards. They weren't stones. They were made out of wood. And so there we were, uh, me and my friend Jeff Smith. We were in our in my backyard, and we had our house, which which sat uh, probably oh 50 yards off of the road inside the fence. Had a huge, beautiful yard in the front, and a huge shaded backyard in the back. And and in the back also was an apartment. And this was this was an old, 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 old building, uh, and the upstairs was like one room and a little bedroom, and I never went downstairs because it was it was all boarded off and and everything else. And then there was a garage portion, and that's where we parked our cars. And my my one brother Wayne had a hubcap collection, and there were hubcaps all over the walls in this garage. And um, my friend Jeff and I were playing in the backyard, and I remember we were sitting on uh, a doghouse. And just as 10-year-old boys do, you, you sit and you talk, and you're just goofing around and, and all those kind of things. And um, I, rem I can't remember what we were talking about, but we I remember distinctly we said, if there are any evil spirits, give us a sign. And I wish we'd have never uttered those words. Because as soon as we uttered those words, there was an old wooden door with a spring that would, would tension the door back into place. And at that moment, that door swung open and swung shut so violently and hard. And then, a second time, it swung open and swung shut with the same ferocity. And I can remember looking at my friend Jeff and him looking at me and our eyes for these 11, 10, 9, 10, 11 year old boys were huge. And the hubcaps, the walls, began to rumble and shake, just as if there were an earthquake. And then it subsided. We screamed, we ran inside the house, and we hid. So that's my second scary ghost story from the Utah State Prison. And there's a lot of ghost stories from the Utah State Prison. Ghosts roaming the halls of D-Block. And... Uh, uh, ghosts 
uh, of executed prisoners uh, making appearances and those kind of things. So those those are all kinds of scary stories, and I'd, I'd like to go back and get more of those stories and, and hear more of them. Um, one other, and this isn't really a scary story, but it was kind of creepy. Um, in our root cellar at the house at the prison were the chairs. We, For whatever reason, they stored the chairs that the prisoners were executed in our root cellar. And they were, they were just a wooden chair with with arms that would come up and kind of go around and, and, and on those arms of the wooden chairs there were leather straps where they would strap the patient in and there were leather straps where they would strap their ankles to the chair. And my brother Wayne, um, God bless him, he, he was, he was a, a major tease and, and I remember one afternoon because I was, a, I, was, I was a scaredy cat kid. I was afraid of my own shadow. Um, a lot of times and I, re I remember him getting me to go down into the root cellar with him and when I got in there he strapped me into the chair strapped my arms and my legs to the chair and then went up the root cellar steps and shut the root cellar door and the root cellar door was very similar to what you see uh, in those tornado movies where they you know it's kind of on an angle and they fold over and, and close. And and there I was, sitting in this chair. And I don't even remember how old I was, but I was I was fairly young at the time. But I remember that door closing. And I remember just sitting in that chair as a young kid, just bawling my eyes out because I was so petrified that some goblin or something was going to get me and I'm, I'm strapped into this chair that they uh, executed the prisoners in that men who committed heinous crimes um, were executed in. and I can remember uh, as a young boy I can remember execution days these are kind of ghouly and gory stories not really scary ghost stories right now, as the first two were, but um, just kind of creepy stories. I can remember on certain days when executions were to happen, you know, my, my dad would always be at work and he'd be there for long periods of time and have to, have to go to work early, of course. He was the deputy warden and that's why we had to live on, on the prison grounds. But I remember on those days that you know, they say the execution is at 10 a.m. or 9 a.m. Or, or whatever it is. I can remember, I can remember this, the, the shots. We lived close enough to the proper, the actual main campus of the prison. You could, you could hear that stuff easily, but I, I can actually remember, at least on one occasion, hearing the shots of a prisoner being ex executed. I wish I could go back and remember what year it was or whatever, because then I could tell what prisoner it was. But it was the summertime, and, and I remember being outside. And we had houseboys and yard boys um, that were prisoners. They were what we called trustees that um, did all our yard work, did all our housework. Did all, did all, it, was like, it was like having slaves, basically. and, and um, it was just kind of an interesting childhood, but I can remember them just standing there um, at that moment uh, when when that execution took place. So that's kind of my creepy stories from Draper, Utah. When I was 12 years old, we moved to uh, we moved to Sandy, Utah, and we moved into a home, and it was it was it was very strange for me as a 12 year old boy because as, as, a, as a little boy uh, my nearest neighbors were about a mile, mile and a quarter away and for some reason parents didn't like sending their kids over to my house to play. They had this thing about letting their kids come play at the prison grounds. It was probably one of the safest places to be because those guys wanted to get out. They, hadn't, they didn't want to hang around there so 
but I, I, as, a, as an adult, I can understand their, their fear and, and stuff like that. So moving to Sandy, Utah, into a house where we had neighbors every 25 feet, um, you know, it, to me, I was like, it was like in a candy store. But we moved into this home, and um, it, was a, it was a nice home, and everything was fine about it. But every time you'd go into the basement, you just kind of get the willies feeling. And it has a, this story, this first story has a prison tie. We had a painting that my father brought from the prison when we moved. We had to move, move because of I-15 going through basically where our front yard was. And so the house that we were in uh, was being demolished and going to be raised. And so we had to move. And they changed the state law where the warden and the deputy warden didn't have to live on the prison properties. So anyway, we moved to Sandy, Utah. I'm excited. I've got kids I can go out and play with. I've got all this kind of cool stuff. Um, and then we have uh, just an eerie feeling in the basement. And this painting was done with chalk and it was of an old man but it was an old man with very angry eyes so just the painting alone was or the, I guess it was a chalk not, a, not an actual painting but just that alone was very creepy and I don't know if my, my brothers and sisters remember that painting at all or that picture at all but I, I have vivid memories of it and I remember one night and, and it was it was such a creepy thing we we had kind of like a little cellar and whenever it would be out i would put it away i would put it away because i didn't i didn't like it and my my bedroom was downstairs i remember one night going to bed and i uh went to bed like i normally do sleeping fine and i woke up and I had a little desk across from my bed. It was a built-in desk. And I woke up, and all I could see was this chalk face staring at me. Again, like when I, when I was in that cornfield when I was younger, the hair on my neck stood, on my arms stood, and I was petrified. So, so petrified that all I could do was lay in my bed and quiver. And I looked again, and I could see the frame of the picture, and I could see that face. Afraid to call out for my mom and dad, afraid to do anything else, I just laid there. And I don't know how long I laid there, but it was a long, long time. Finally, I drifted off to sleep. And the next morning when I woke up, I remembered all the events of that night, and I was scared. And I looked over, and there was no painting. There was no face. I got up to look for it. I couldn't find it anywhere. It was strange. I got up, went to school that day, came home, and as I went down the stairs, just that cold, eerie feeling came over me. And where the painting had been previously in another room, it, that's where it was. And it was not there that morning. I asked my mom and dad, where they moved that, why they moved that. That's my sister. None of them knew what I was talking about. So that's just kind of another eerie, creepy story from Sandy. Now, one more from Sandy. I, I've got a couple more. And then, if you've got comments or scary stories, post them on the comments things. Type them out. Put them in there. I like to say, I wish I, wish I had my phone set up, um, but I don't. Because I'd love to, I'd love to have that that interaction with you. 
Um, another story from Sandy, the house in Sandy. This is when I was uh, a teenager. Um, actually, probably, probably 19 or so. Just before I ate one night, and my parents, I don't know where they were, they were not there. I, th I think they were out of town. My sister was uh, at college. And so I, I, I'm basically in the house alone. And so I get ready, I go to bed. Uh, I go downstairs to my bedroom and climb into bed and I'm sound asleep. And then suddenly I can hear someone walking upstairs. I heard them walk down a hallway. I mean, my bedroom was kind of underneath where the hallway was. And I heard them, and in the kitchen there was a door that um, led to the stairwell to go down to the basement. And I distinctly remember the door. I could hear the door open. You, you know how you hear the, the door handle turn? And you, you can just tell someone's opening the door. And so I, I was like, what the heck is going on here? So I get out of my bed and I go walking upstairs and the bedroom and the door at the top of the stairs is wide open, which was closed. And I heard footsteps going down back through the kitchen and uh, down the hallway. And down the hallway, was there were two bedrooms at the end of the hallway. So... I'm thinking, well, maybe mom and dad came home. Maybe my sister came home from college or whatever. And so I go down there, and there is absolutely nobody there. No one at all. Who knows? Scary ghost story. Or a ghost story. Not really scary, because I, I didn't have any of the willies or any of those kind of things. However, I did sleep on the couch that night. Upstairs. Okay, another... Little story from Sandy, Utah. Hey, Lindsay, how are you? I was just telling stories about uh, our house, which is right next to your house in Sandy, Utah. Uh, one, one other story from Sandy. My mother had a sister who died when, when she was a teenager. And one of the things that she got was a music box from her sister that, that, that belonged to her sister. That was one of the things that she got um, to remember her sister by. And I'd like to know where that music box is today. I hope one of my sisters has that music box. But strangely, that music box, on the day of my mother's sister who died, it was her birth, that birthday, the music box started to play. Spooky? A little bit. A little bit. But it did that a couple of times. It's kind of interesting. My sons have memories of uh, my grandfather. My old son has a memory of my grandfather visiting him after my grandfather had died. My youngest son, I believe, has a memory of my father, seeing my father in his room when he was when he was a young boy. And I'll tell you one last ghost story. This isn't a scary ghost story. This is a good ghost story. When I was living in San Clemente, California. This is while well. I was on my LDS mission. I had been out for a month or so. And I remember struggling with different things and having lots of questions. And my grandmother died when I was probably, I was less than five. 
want to say she died in like 1962, so I would have been just about five. And I remember distinctively struggling and just worrying about different things, wondering if I'm making any difference, wondering if I'm doing any good, those kind of things. And um, I remember one night my companion is in a bed less than six feet away from me. And I distinctly remember my grandmother standing at the end of my bed. Such a sweet feeling of peace. very sweet ghost story. So I remember that and I remember her actually sitting on the bed and telling me what I was doing is right. She didn't say what you are doing is right. She said this is right. That's it. And just that sweet feeling, because I never really knew my grandmother. I was, in fact, as a little boy, I was scared of her because the only memory I have of her when she was alive is chewing me out for sliding down the steps. You're going to wear out the carpet. Walk down those stairs. Don't slide down. I just remember being afraid of her. And she was hurting with sickness at that time. But I'll never forget the sweet peace that was there in the bedroom of a, an apartment of a young, confused missionary when his grandma comes to his telling this is right. But everybody, I am done telling my ghost stories. Um, I'm looking at the comments here seeing what's on here. Uh, Brandon, how are you? I hope you're doing well. Hope you're settled into your new position at work. Uh, looking for great things from you. We've had Tim here, Derek here, Don here, Dustin, Bill, Nick, Scott. Had a few of you here. Anyway, those, those earlier things are just a few stories from my youth. Hopefully that... Uh, Hopefully it's been entertaining. Like I say, I do uh, Close Encounters of the Ghost Kind every year. So for 2019, we're going to sign off Close Encounters of the Ghost Time. Everybody out there, hope everybody does great. Have a safe, happy Halloween. Do some great things with your family. Make some wonderful memories with your family because that is the most important thing is making those good memories with your family whether it's your kids, whether it's your grandkids, uncles, aunts, cousins, whatever it is, make those memories. God bless. We'll see you next time. This is Bob from Brave Haven Media saying good night, everybody.